Uh, senior Follies, there are seven tickets available for the Senior Follies left for Saturday, May 14th at 4 p.m. Reserve your ticket by emailing Noel, her address is in the bulletin, or call the church office. Registration is also going on now for summer fun for church members. Uh, community registration begins March the 16th. They're also taking staff applications for summer fun, and you can visit the website to fill out that application online. There will be PYC tonight, 6 to 8. And finally, uh, Mandy Davis and uh, members of the Central Youth Choir are attending a youth choir festival in Myrtle Beach. Please keep them uh, in their, their leaders and the chaperones in your prayers as they travel. And let us worship the Lord. Would you stand and please join me in the call to worship? Bless the Lord, O my soul. The one who came to serve. Bless the Lord, O my soul. The one who knows our need. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Who leads us into life. God of the sparrow, the whale, the earthquake, the hungry, the neighbor. God of all life, we come to you this morning to worship. As we worship you and celebrate all that you have done and continue to do, open our eyes that we may see the world around us in all its glory. Let us worship the Lord.
me in the call to confession, followed by silent prayer of confession. The God of mercy hears our cries. Let us confess our failings and needs to each other and to the one who commands us to come and be healed. Let us pray. Holy God, Holy God you, you know us better than we know ourselves. You, you see our need when we are blind to it. You, you have made us to be yours. In your compassion, forgive us for our lack of faith and of the harm we do to others and to your earth. Forgive us for turning away from your will, for ignoring the cries of our neighbors, for failing to listen to what is most nourishing, even for ourselves. Let our faults fall from your eyes as you open the house. Amen. Children, your God has not forgotten you. Jesus knows your weaknesses and sees through your presence. You are made whole simply by seeking forgiveness. Receive the Lord's pardon and believe that it's true. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. All the children come forward, please. Okay, I have something to show you again this week, okay? Give me a second. I'm going to try to put this on for you, okay? I might look a little funny. You can laugh, but not for more than 10 seconds, okay? Okay, who has ever seen someone with these? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. When you see somebody wearing these, what does it make you think? What does it make you think, Dagan? It usually makes you think that they might be blind. You're exactly right. Now, I know, especially my older kids, I know what you, that you probably know what it means to be blind, right? Who can tell me, what does that mean if you are blind? We actually practiced being blind this morning in Sunday school. What does it mean, Boone, to be blind? Yeah, you don't know what you're doing when you can't see, do you? You're exactly right. In fact, our story today is about a man named Bartimaeus. And we're talking about being blind because Bartimaeus was blind. In the story today, we, we meet Bartimaeus, and he's on the side of the road as Jesus and his disciples are passing by. They're on their way to Jerusalem. And the, Bar the Bible tells us that Bartimaeus was a beggar, okay? That means that he probably didn't own a lot of things, he was probably pretty poor, and he also couldn't see. As Jesus passes by, we hear Bartimaeus start to holler out to Jesus. And he says, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on me. Because you see, Bartimaeus has heard about Jesus. And he's heard about the amazing things that Jesus has done. And he's hoping that Jesus can do something amazing for him too. But all these people around him are telling Bartimaeus, they're saying, Bartimaeus, shh, be quiet. 
Leave Jesus alone. But you know what? He doesn't. He keeps on, and he cries out to Jesus, and eventually Jesus hears him and says, come to me. Now, I thought it was kind of interesting when I read this story in the Bible. When Jesus says, come to me, Bartimaeus is so excited that he takes his cloak, which is just a fancy word for jacket, he throws it off, and he runs to Jesus. That cloak was probably the only thing he owned, but he threw it down because Jesus called his name. Now, if you were in Sunday school, you know the happy part of the story, right? What happens to Bartimaeus when he meets Jesus, Emily? Tell them. Oh, Jesus heals him. You're exactly right. Jesus heals him, and Bartimaeus leaves our story today following Jesus on his way to Jerusalem with his sight for the very first time. Now, this story is an incredible miracle. I want you to remember that. Jesus did many incredible miracles. But you know what? This story is also a story of faith. Bartimaeus had amazing faith. He was blind. He had never even seen Jesus before. But he heard about Jesus, and he believed that Jesus could do amazing things. So I want you to think about that this week as you're going to school and doing your everyday things. We're kind of like Bartimaeus. We can't see Jesus either. We have to trust and have faith that he is there, even when things aren't going so well. Okay? All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Here we go. Father God, thank you for reminding us that you are the ultimate healer. Help us to have faith like Bartimaeus this week. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, if you're going to Children's Church, you can head with me. If not, you can have a seat with your parents. Please join me for the litany of illumination and notice that the parts in italics will be sung. From the stars to the seas, from the mountain to the meadow, landscape to lake, creation is a vast canvas declaring your glory, Lord. Open our eyes and help us to see. child to octogenarian, from African to Australian, Caucasian to Cantonese, humanity is a vast canvas declaring your glory, Lord. Open our eyes and help us to see. From crocodile to caterpillar, from wombats to weasels, beavers to buffalo, wildlife is a vast canvas declaring your glory, Lord. Open our eyes and help us to see. Open our eyes and help us to see your amazing universe of diversity, delight, and dynamism. Through spirits soaring in wonder, hearts lifted in awe, and minds filled with imaginative thought. Open our eyes and help us to see your amazing world and our place within it, our duty to care for it all, our call to serve it all.
gather in your church today, thrilled to view the wonder of life, yet not to be blind to the troubles and traumas. Open our eyes, see the needs of hurting humanity. Open our eyes, see the disharmony in nature and in the May we respond in ways that help rather than hinder, assist rather than aggravate, maintain rather than mistreat. Open our eyes today, Lord of creation to see from your holy perspective. As you can tell, I'm not Dr. Bailey, so we continue in prayer for him as he um, battles a fever and a cough and is at home ill. The gospel reading for today is found on page 46 in your pew Bible. It's the gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 32 through 52. Hear now these words from the word. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. Jesus took the twelve aside again and began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do something for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with baptism, which, with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those who, for whom it has been prepared. Then the ten, when the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom, whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timenus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, 
he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and amazing God, in a world that swirls with so many words, speak your eternal he word here and now, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week, we looked at the story of the rich man who came to Jesus, wanted to know what else he needed to do besides obeying the commandments in order to earn eternal life. Jesus tells him that to earn it, he needs to sell everything and give it to the poor and come and follow him. The man leaves sadly and the disciples are incredulous and want to know how anyone can possibly then be saved. Jesus tells them it is impossible for her humans to earn salvation, but with God, all things are possible. Salvation is a gift and not something to be earned. What does it mean that there is no cost to discipleship. There is a difference between salvation and discipleship. Discipleship is when is what we do in response to salvation, not to earn it. Jesus leads the way in this, and at this point, for the third time, he tells his disciples what lies ahead for them in Jerusalem. He sets off on the road towards Jerusalem with such single-minded determination that he's walking ahead of everyone else. And the people with him are amazed, but also fearful. Mark reports, he calls the disciples to him and tells them again that in Jerusalem, he will be arrested, tortured, put to death, and will rise again on the third day. And for the third time, this information fails to register with them. In the very next story, James and John come to Jesus and ask him to promise them that he will seat them in the right and left hands when he comes into his glory. James and John, along with Peter, were the disciples Jesus took with him on special occasions. So it is not too surprising that they might think that they would have a place of honor in the hierarchy that Jesus is supposed to bring. It definitely seems like a power play against Peter, though. Jesus doesn't commend them or explode at their lack of understanding. He tells them they really don't understand what they are asking for. He asked them if they were ready to be baptized with the baptism he will receive or drink the cup that he will have to drink. They assure him that they are ready. What we don't know and they don't know is that Jesus will pray fervently in the garden asking his father to take away the cup, suffering and death from him if possible. And when he comes into his glory, 
it will be two thieves on his right hand and on his left hand rather than two disciples. Jesus assures them that in time they will indeed drink from the same cup and be baptized with the same fire, though they do not yet understand what that means, but that it will not be in his hands to grant positions of authority. You can't keep the stuff like this quiet, of course. The other ten disciples heard about James and John doing this power grab, and they were indignant. Jesus used the occasion to teach them about servant ministry. He himself did not come to be served by others, but to serve. And they were called to the same life. In the kingdom of God, greatness is achieved by humbling oneself and serving others. The fourth vignette today's reading is about the healing of a blind man named Bartimaeus. I want to focus primarily on this story and use it to reflect on the ones that have gone before it. The story takes place outside of Jericho, which is the last stop before heading up the steep incline to Jerusalem. Mark is coming to the heart of his story, Holy Week, the Passion Narrative. Mark is eager to get to Holy Week, eager to get to Jerusalem. He does not tell us about anything that happened in Jericho, whereas Luke tells us about Jesus and his encounter with the tax collector, Zacchaeus. Mark simply says, they came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, and he recounts the following story. There was a blind beggar named Bartimaeus who was sitting by the road in order to beg for alms from pilgrims traveling to Jerusalem for the holy day of Passover. There would have been many people making this pilgrimage so that having a large traveling group pass by would not have been unusual. The road from Jericho to Jerusalem is a steep, winding road with lots of hiding places, which was once renowned for, as a favorite haunt for robbers. Jesus set his parable of the Good Samaritan on this road because of that occasion. Traveling this road in a crowd would provide safety in numbers. Now Bartimaeus heard this large crowd passing by and thought there must have been something different about the atmosphere here. He listened intently, as blind people must do, and picked up that it was Jesus of Nazareth who was at the very center of this group. Whether Bartimaeus had heard of Jesus before, or whether the first time about him on his occasion, he had an inkling that this man could do more than give him a few coins. So he cried out loudly and repeatedly, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David is a messianic title which indicates that Blind Bartimaeus is already seen more clearly than the actual followers of Jesus. He begins to get the point. Bartimaeus does not seem to have any advocates for him, no friends to intercede with Jesus or lead him to Jesus as a paralytic man had his four friends to lift him down through the roof to Jesus. In fact, Bartimaeus seems to only have people around him who want him to stay in his place and be quiet. Mark says, many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But Bartimaeus was not content to be kept in his place and was determined not to let this opportunity slip by. So he called out even more loudly, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, who had been walking so resolutely towards Jerusalem that it amazed and made fearful his followers, heard him and stopped 
in his tracks. And he did a fascinating thing here, as the Bible tells us. He said to the crowd, call him here. Now, Jesus could have directly called Bartimaeus to him. He could have healed him from a distance. He could have walked over to Bartimaeus, and rather than making this man stumble over to him through the crowd to Jesus. Instead, Jesus gives the crowd a role to play in the healing of this man. The crowd, which had been telling Bartimaeus to be quiet and to quit bothering the great man and quit disrupting the dignity and majesty of the processional pilgrimage to a holy festival in Jerusalem, is told by Jesus to call Bartimaeus. It is a kind of funny that the word in Greek is Phoneo, call him, phone him. Much to the saying of, I'll have my people call your people. So look at the transformation that takes place. The people who had been speaking harshly to Bartimaeus and excluding him from fellowship are now seeking words of encouragement or speaking words of encouragement and hope to him. Take heart, they say. Get up, he's calling you. It is a brilliant thing Jesus does. If he handles this man all by himself, people are allowed to sit by and be bystanders. They can re remove themselves from the event and even sit in judgment on what Jesus is doing if they wish. But once they have gotten involved, it forces them to examine their own attitudes and actions and allows them to be part of the ministry and enter into the joy of the one who is healed. They had a role in it. Think of Jesus at the feeding of the 5,000 saying to his disciples, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. It was the disciples who distributed the food, making them feel a vital part of the miracle. And think of Jesus when the disciples were trying to keep children away from him. He said, bring the little children to me. I, note, I not only want them to come to me, I want you to bring them to me. And they become a priority for you, too. I'm sure you're getting the implications for our discipleship. Jesus has turned what could have been a one-on-one -on -one encounter into a group participant participation ministry event. It's what happens when you volunteer at AIM or the free clinic or the soup kitchen and actually you know some of the people who need your help, their help. It's no longer as easy to ignore them or write them off. Those personal connections make all the difference and bring us into the ministry of God with them. Bartimaeus wasting Waste no time, Mark says. Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Last week, we encountered the rich man who left Jesus as a sad non-disciple because he was unwilling to leave his stuff behind. Bartimaeus eagerly casts off his one possession, his coat, and runs to Jesus, throwing caution to the wind. When Bartimaeus got to Jesus, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? The irony is exquisite here, as the question surely has some around Jesus squirming. In the previous story, James and John came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to do this for us, whatever we ask of you. That's quite a trap. Will you do me a favor? Do you answer that? Of course. Or do you need more information? Jesus doesn't fall for it and ask them, you guessed it. What do you want me to do for you? Their, their answer shows their incredible blindness. And at this point, after all they have seen and heard of Jesus in their time together, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asks Bartimaeus, my teacher, let me see again. 
The irony is that his vision is already clearer than that of the disciples. Jesus says, go, your faith has made you well. Actually, the verb used by Jesus has many nuances. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has saved you. The verb sozo is the root of the word translation salvation. So the results of what Jesus does seem to have more impact than just on the eyesight of Bartimaeus. Mark tells us that immediately Bartimaeus regained his sight. The ending is different from most healing stories in Mark. Usually Jesus tells the recipient to go away and don't tell anybody what has happened. But rather, Bartimaeus does not, he goes and tells, he's told by Jesus to go and tell what has been done and to follow me. From a daily routine of sitting beside the road begging from passerbys, Bartimaeus takes his place in the community of the pilgrims and disciples on their way to Jerusalem for Passover. After seeing the beautiful holy city appear on the horizon, and the excitement of Palm Sunday Parade, his eyes will get a true baptism by fire. Conflict, arrest, trial, crucifixion of the man who gave him sight. Life would have been simpler and perhaps less stressful as a blind beggar on the road leading out of Jericho. Then again, perhaps his years of being shunned and excluded and looked down upon, prepared him for this event, and he handled it better than even the disciples who, deserve, who deserted ship later on. Now, I'd love to know more about what happened to Bartimaeus, but we don't have that privilege. What, we, what do we want Jesus to do for us is a basic question. Make us rich and powerful, healthy and wise. It is important to stop and evaluate our requests, our motives, and our values of what we ask Jesus to do for us. We could have a lot worse requests than that of Bartimaeus. Help me see clearly. Help me understand that discipleship is not about positions or glory, or about, but rather about positions of service. The prayer in a song from God's spell still says it well. Day by day, O oh dear Lord, three things I pray, to see thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, to follow thee more nearly day by day. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Having heard the word of God read and proclaimed, let us together sit, stand and affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Brother and sister in Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
1 Thessalonians urges us to pray without ceasing, so as the body of Christ, let us pray. Almighty God, who in the winter of the year is able to make it summer in our hearts, we pray that we may enter into the life of faith and love that was taught to us by your Son, Jesus. Help us to turn from all earthly idols from con confidence in our confidence in our money and what it can buy, from pride in our positions and what they mean to others, from trust in good health and its continuance, from addiction to pleasure and self-indulgence and sin, and to walk humbly in your gracious spirit. Make us sober in our minds, clear-sighted, and able to see life from an eternal perspective. Let us, like the disciples of old, leave all in order to find everything. Show us the joy in serving others, the poor who are always in need, the hungry who never know comfort, the sick who can take no pleasure in life, the untutored who cannot read your word for those who are grieving, who need your touch and your comfort. Heavenly Father, grant your peace to all of these and to us who are able to know and follow your will, which has been made known to us from ancient times in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray collectively, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue in our mission season, and it is my um, privilege to introduce to you Laura Lindsley from Calvary Home to bring us a word about our ministry there and how we contribute and what the larger picture is. You're welcome to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, good morning, everybody. And... Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, so thank you guys just so much for letting me have this opportunity to come and share a little bit about who we are. Um, for those of you that don't know, we are just right up the road about four minutes away. So um, I would love for you guys all to swing by campus one day. Um, Cheryl has uh, come for a tour and she can tell you that um, I can tell you about Calvary Home all day and all night, but until you really come and see campus and who we are and what we look like, um, you probably won't get a full understanding of what we do. Would you agree with that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but um, so Calvary Home for Children, um, that is exactly what we are. We are a home for children in foster care. Um, we take, we have five homes on our campus. Um, so that means that we have five foster families on our campus caring for children in a home that looks a lot like your home. Um, most of you probably think um, an orphanage, okay, little orphan Annie, that, if that's what you're thinking, please erase that. That's not, that's not who we are at all. Um, we do not have dormitory style living. Um, we don't have bunk beds lined up against the wall and 12 kids piled in a room. That, that is not who we are um, because that's not normal for children. Um, your homes probably have one, maybe two kids in a bedroom, um, and that's, that's what we do too, um, because we feel like that is normal, and that these kids have been through extensive trauma, and that they still deserve a normal childhood. Um, so we really work to restore a normalcy and teach them a new normal, um, restore a normal childhood for them. So, so that they can be children again and find that joy of being a child um, and learn how to live in a normal family um, so that when they get older, they can choose what they want to do in life. Um, 
So for an example, we have a precious um, girl, Allison. Um, she was 10 years old when she came to Calvary Home, and her foster parents had their high school diploma and college degree up on, on the wall, you know, framed, all pretty. Um, and she said, what are those fancy papers? And so her, her foster parents told, told her what they were, and she said, oh, I just thought you went to school until you got tired of going or you got pregnant. So that, in her mind, as a 10-year-old, as a fifth grader, um, she did not know that children graduate high school. She did not know. Um, and I come from a home of educators, and so I didn't know you could drop out. <laughs> like, I didn't know that was a thing until, like, I was in high school. So it was just such a stark contrast to this young lady who she didn't know you finished. Um, and so she has actually been at Calvary Home now for um, eight years. She's been with us, um, which is pretty abnormal for a child to stay that long, but she's had some pretty extenuating circumstances. Um, so this young lady has since graduated high school, the very first in her family to ever graduate. Um, she's going to, to Tri-County and studying megatronics, and we are incredibly proud of her. I have no idea what Medicatronics are. She's tried to tell me, but I still don't get it. Um, but that's okay, because that can be her thing. Um, and so we're very proud of her. Um, she, she knows a new way now. Her life before looked one way, and she came to Calvary Home, and now she has a new normal. And she can choose, as an adult, how she wants to raise her family. Um, and that is really one of the biggest goals of Calvary Home, is to care for these children while their parents are working on a treatment plan, whether that is a successful plan that is out of our control. Um, and so we kind of care for them while their parents are working on that. And our goal is to help them to push through and, and learn a new normal for when they become adults. Um, this church has really been supporting us since 2003. So that is shortly after we opened our first home. So you guys have been with us for the long haul now and kind of really watched us grow to now five homes um, and almost $10,000 across all those years. So that is really incredible. And we just really thank you for your support um, and who you are and how you stand beside us. Um, and I would love to chat with each of you. I brought some brochures um, or some paperwork and stuff. So if you're interested in that, I would love to, to give you that if you just want to snag me after service. Um, but I would love if you guys want to plan a field trip, whether it's just individually or a Sunday school class or something, um, and, and get you guys out to campus so you can really see what we do. Um, but thank you again. Thank you, Laura, for bringing us um, good news and how God is working through the lives of people that work with Calvary Home and through you as well. Freely has God given to us in Jesus Christ. Let us now worship God with our tithes and our offerings.
us pray. Oh God, we bring our gifts in imitation of your many gifts to us, of life and food and shelter and friendship, and worship you for the unspeakable goodness of your spirit. As we present our gifts back to you, we pray that they may use for your glory, proclaiming that your good news around the world. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Amen.